I now want to link insulin resistance to various chronic diseases. And I'm first going to start with, of course, what I've devoted my life to, which is Alzheimer's disease. And we're, you know, right now, 55 million people worldwide have this disease. In my standpoint, and what I advocate for is lifestyle interventions that you should be adopting to lower the risk of getting this disease. It's scary because the this disease starts in our 20s and in our 30s. And then we get diagnosed in our late 60s, early 70s. So what role does insulin play or insulin resistance in this disease? Right. I love that you've asked this question in part because of my own work on the topic. My lab has published multiple papers now looking at these metabolic origins of Alzheimer's. If you'll allow me, let me just share a, a brief history of how this view has evolved uh, n until just very recently, and indeed in many circles, it's still the case, Alzheimer's disease was viewed as a disorder of plaques accumulating in the brain. And these plaques would be just literally physically disrupting the connection along a neuron, where a neuron is sending mm -hmm. its signals as rapidly as possible to help retain memory and, and proper cognitive function. So the view had been that it was entirely plaque-based. Now, there have been a large group of scientists, myself among them, who have said the plaques are simply a feature of some brains and not causing the problem because we have had interventions even in human trials that have been drugs that very effectively remove plaques and yet in no way improved cognition. And then this all really reached a peak uh, about three years ago or so when the original data that was used to begin the whole plaque-based theory of the disease was found to be falsified. It was fake mm. data that had been put together by a scientific team that literally gave birth to the entire plaque based view of the disorder. So it was built on a lie. And in my view, there has never been any convincing evidence to suggest that plaques are relevant at all. Thus, there's an opportunity for an alternate paradigm. Which is probably why you've, I don't know if you share this view, but you probably have it discussed in the um, current FDA approved IV medications that are used to uh, get rid of the plaque buildup in the brains, which is causing brain tissue loss and hemorrhages. Yeah, it was I, I bet we're referring to the same drug where the FDA approved a drug against the recommendation of the special panel. Yes. So a special panel had been put together to review this latest Alzheimer's drug and suggested based on the evidence that there was no benefit to the disease and it should not be approved. The FDA approved it anyway, and their justification yeah. for improve, for approving it was that they didn't want to discourage further development in the area. And so they approved a drug that they knew didn't work that is horrifically expensive and, as you noted, has uh, some meaningful consequences that are not good. So – with all of this, hopefully, crumbling of the plaque-based theory of, of of Alzheimer's, there needs to be an alternate paradigm or, or view, and that, of course, has left a lot of room for the metabolic view to grow, and it is growing rapidly. As you noted, uh, appropriately, it can start as early as people in their 20s. Uh, one of my friends and uh, a person I respect tremendously as a scientist is a man out of a university in Canada called Sherbrooke University in Eastern Canada oh, yeah. named Stephen Cunane. Stephen Cunane published a paper a number of years ago looking at young, healthy women in their 20s. Women do suffer from Alzheimer's disease more than men, and so that makes it very relevant. But in these women who had polycystic ovary syndrome, which is insulin resistance that's affected the ovaries, and in women who were matched with body weight and size and everything else and age who didn't have PCOS, he found that in the young women, remember, these are girls in their mid-20s, the young women with PCOS had a reduced ability in their brains to take in glucose. And now this sort of gets us to the heart of the matter. The brain is an energy hog. It has a tremendous demand for nutrients, and it primarily relies on only two, glucose and ketones. Now, they're not equal in their ability to get into the brain. And this is where some of Dr. Cunane's work and work from my own lab has filled in some gaps where glucose requires an insulin um, dependent mechanism to get in, in certain parts of the brain, including in the hypothalamus and some of these other regions of cognition and memory and learning. 
And so where you have glucose attempting to come into the brain to nourish it, because remember the brain has a high energy need, insulin has to come and knock on those doors, like I said earlier about the muscle, to allow the glucose to come in. Ketone has no such regulation. If ketones are up in the blood, they can pass into the brain cells perfectly happily without any gatekeeper in telling them whether they can come in or not. The tragedy is, in a case of insulin resistance, one, it's twofold. One, not only can the brain not get the glucose very well because the insulin isn't working on knocking the doors open very well, so it's not getting its glucose well. And then you'd, and this is what Dr. Kunain found, that in these young women with PCOS, their brain glucose uptake was significantly diminished. Now you would say, hmm. okay, that's fine, brain. Don't be so picky. Just use the ketones. However, as, as I alluded to earlier, in a person who has insulin resistance and high insulin, insulin stops the production of ketones very, very well. Even a modest increase in insulin inhibits ketogenesis. There, it's, a, it's a proper time for me to invoke this old poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, where you have this dehydrated, dying, starving sailor dying of thirst and he bemoans the fact that he's surrounded by water that he can't drink. This is akin mm. to the brain being surrounded by glucose. Blood glucose levels could be higher than normal, and yet it can't get it. It's sort of crying out that there's glucose everywhere, but I can't use it. And so it's starving in the midst of plenty, crying out for ketones that the body is not making because the insulin is too high to allow it to do so. So Alzheimer's disease is insulin resistance of the brain. And then maybe my final point on the topic is that Dr. Kunain and others, more and more groups now are showing this, my lab included, that when you do give the brain ketones, not only does it use the ketones very readily, indeed, if the brain has a preference for any fuel, it is ketones far more than glucose. Even if you aren't in a ketogenic state? It, as long, well, yeah, it depends on how the ketones get in. So we would say ketogenic if you're making your own ketones or if a person is profoundly insulin resistant and has trouble getting into ketosis on their own, all the more reason to drink them. But however a person can raise their ketones, the brain starts using those ketones immediately. Even indeed, even if a person has glucose levels that are this high, six millimolar, and they have uh, ketones that are only at two millimolar, the brain is already shifting its metabolism to rely more on the ketones, even in a healthy person without insulin resistance, but it's all the more desperate when the ketones are the only fuel the brain can practically use. And we want that, right? Because we want the brain to have its fuel source so it can then have the chance to fight off whatever it is it needs to fight off. I always talk about uh, brain energetics and the fact that, you know, we need to be able to fight, you know, amyloid itself, the protein itself gets elevated when the innate immune system is activated. And that gets activated in response to an infection or stress, whatever that may be. So you want the brain to be actively fueled so you can fight off any type of inflammation that comes its way. That's very well said. Absolutely. And then just with regards to strict energy use, neurons themselves need a constant supply of energy in order to maintain the normal nerve conductance. As it's sending a signal from point A to point mm. B, it takes, it's using energy. In fact, not an insignificant amount to do that. If it can't use glucose to provide that energy in the form of ATP, then it needs ketones to do it. And this is where there are some exciting developments where you see that even in early stage Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment, if you give the individual ketones, their cognition improves. There are case reports that document mm. Alzheimer's patients that are so cognitively impaired that they can't tie their shoes. They can't draw the face of a clock, of an analog clock at all. It's just absolute yeah. chaos. Give them ketones. And then a few hours later, repeat the assessments, all of a sudden they can tie their shoes. Now they can draw the face of a clock, not perfectly, they're still cognitively impaired, but there is absolute demonstrable improvement. And again, my lab's shown this, Dr. Kunain has shown this, and many others so worldwide is this, at this point. My next question then is, is this beta hydroxybutyrate? Because I know there's different types of ketones, right? There are generally two main ketones, yeah. acetoacetate and then beta hydroxybutyrate. Beta hydroxybutyrate is the main one that is circulating in the blood and thus the main one that is used. And so when it comes to various exogenous ketone products, they're all going to be based on BHB, whether it's a, a ketone salt 
or it's BH beta hydroxybutyrate combined with a mineral, whether it's uh, an ester or whether it's these bioidentical um, BHB from like a company like Original Ketone. You know, there are different varieties of them all. And hopefully you get one that tastes good because I, I got to tell you, I've been in the presence of a little small bottle. It's a liquid form of ketones and it tasted like like gasoline mixed with nail polish. Well, let me please pardon this because I'll just say my favorite, and I have no vested interest in this company. My favorite is the original ketone. It tastes like a fruit tart, like a okay. tart uh, fruit, like a nice kind of politely, sweetly sour taste. It is a absolutely the best. Okay. I love this. I love the, the, the thing, like the action items that we're putting against everything because I would advocate everybody to adopt this even without, you know, we get so many questions and saying, but Louisa, I have the APOE4 gene or Louisa, I don't have the APOE4 gene. I'm like irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Everything raises your risk of getting this disease. And a lot of things can lower your risk. The APOE4 gene should be redundant by now with the amount of research that we have on it. So I'm going to go out and get myself some um, BHP.